well, let's talk about the the bill that just passed the House. Um, the um, here it is, the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act of 2023, because this relies on that those civil rights laws that you were talking about. It's basically saying it's trying. Uh, my understanding is it's trying to add this definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, to the civil right to let's see what is it uh, the definition of anti-Semitism adopted on May 26, 2016 by the IRHA uh, will uh, can be a factor in deciding whether there's been a violation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act and the Department of Education shall take into consideration this definition of anti-Semitism. I've pulled up the definition here. It's also uh, interestingly based yeah. off of not just an individual status as a Jew, but also their perceived status uh, as an ethnic Jew, which I think is an interesting component, right? I mean, this is a very, in my view, an overly broad definition that we're talking about. Right. I mean, th this is what they're they're pulling from the International Holocaust uh, Remembrance Association and um, most of these bullet point uh, alliance, thank you, are most most of these bullet points are like I would agree fully like these are anti-Semitic beliefs uh, accusing the Jews of inventing or exaggerating the Holocaust, accusing, um, let's see, accusing Jews of being responsible uh, for real or imagined wrongdoing committed by a single Jewish person or group. Um, but then there's things like uh, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination example by claiming the existence of a state of, of the state of Israel is a racist endeavor or drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis. Um, I think both of those are <laughs> ill-advised and wrong um, rhetorical moves, but um, like is making these historical comparisons, we're now going to fold into civil rights as a civil rights violation that's worthy of termination or suspension. Um, I know that you were on social media kind of pointing out some problems with this law. What What is your issue with the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act? Well, as Ryan Grimm, the journalist, pointed out, it's a law-breaking law. It breaks itself, right? So it, you have all these examples of criticism of Israel that are seen to be anti-Semitic and would be enforced under civil rights law. But then you have this last example of anti-Semitism that says holding Jews collectively responsible for actions of the state of Israel is, is anti-Semitic. So like the, the whole law is connecting Judaism to the state of Israel. And then it says you cannot hold Jews collectively collectively responsible for the state of Israel. So it's like in, internally inconsistent, but even broader than that, speaking to the first amendment, concerns. We've opposed this. This has been around for like nine years. It's never gotten any traction of Congress in Congress. I think we can all understand why it's getting some traction now. But the author of this IHRA definition, Kenneth Stern, himself opposes using it as a legal mechanism to police speech. He said it was meant to create like some sort of consistent definition for U European data collectors to write reports. Nowhere else in anti-discrimination <laughs> law do they lay out specific examples of prohibited speech. We don't see it in anti-black racism. We don't see it in sexism. So this would be the first time that you have examples of otherwise clearly protected speech being excluded um, from protection under civil rights law. I mean, it, it would be struck down in court if it were to pass and it were to be applied to students. But nevertheless, it's going to create a chilling effect by just being on the books. If you risk losing all of your federal funding, which is the only recourse under Title VI, it's never happened before, but colleges and universities are fearful of it. Um, you're going to err on the side of caution when you hear folks on your campus out from the river to the sea or intifada. Do you think that will be a new front in the culture wars, the pulling of funding? Because that's really the lever that the federal government can pull. And we would be remiss not to note over the course of doing this podcast that, you know, for better or worse, many of these universities, the public universities especially, are funded by taxpayers. Um, will we begin to see members of Congress basically not just threatening to pull federal funding for these universities that engage in, um, you know, practices they dislike or support the wrong side in their view? Um, is this sort of the new front in the culture wars? Will things get worse from here? Well, I th think that's always been the implication when you see the, all this like robust pressure put on college and universities is that they're going to pull their federal funding again. But it infrequently happens, right? Like it's always the threat. But it's no, I'm not, not aware of it ever happening. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, it is a threat. And I think it'll continue to be 
wielded. But I, you know, I'm not sure how seriously colleges and universities actually take this threat, or if there's like other reasons why they hmm. um, acquiesce or genuflect to these concerns. Um, you know, I I am just more broadly concerned about the chilling effect it'll create because even if they're not pulling your federal funding, an investigation in and of itself can be a form of punishment. They're super intense, and Columbia is undergoing a Title VI investigation as we speak. Um, yeah, they're death super by bureaucracy is another form of punishing. I think that that's an important yeah. point for people to take away. I mean, how how do you make the case to supporters of something like the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act or just people who are generally turned off by what the pro-Palestinian protesters are doing and don't agree with their cause, where it's tough for them to swallow the sudden love of free speech be that some of these uh, university presidents are professing when the past 10 years were all about trigger warnings and um, like hypersensitivity. Like we all saw that come out and now there seems to be a flip. You know, FIRE is admirably one of those organizations that just stands strong no matter who the aggrieved party is. But like, how do you persuade people who are just, they see this as like rank hypocrisy and uh, that they, they're tired of playing that game? Yeah. Well, you first acknowledge that it is rank hypocrisy that you've seen censorship on college campuses be wheeled against conservatives, libertarians, you know, all around political dissenters on campus for decades. And it's ramped up in the past decade. So you have to acknowledge that. But if you see it as, as a problem, maybe you use this as a moment to try and right the ship. What was it? Rahm Emanuel who said in every crisis is an opportunity. And as civil libertarians, we've always got to call balls and strikes on free speech, right? And just because they've been hi hypocritical in the past isn't a new moment to like come in and improve censorship. Like, I don't know what the al other alternative is. And I think you would be making a serious mistake by supporting things like the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act and because it'll just generate more censorship envy, right? So now you enshrine certain examples that touch core political speech in anti-discrimination law. Um, involving anti-Semitism, you're going to see folks who are concerned about anti-Black racism or sexism or other forms of discrimination then calling for their own examples, right? And Ira Glasser, who I mentioned before, the former executive director of the ACLU, tells a story about how in the 1970s, the National Union of Students in England wanted to pass a hate speech code to uh, oppose uh, racist speech. And they solicited a bunch of student organizations in that country to support them, be co-sponsors of it, and they got the Zionist student organization to do it. Well, what happened a few years later after that hate speech code was passed? Zionism was perceived to be racist hate speech, and it was used against the Zionist student organization. So you have to be careful what you wish for. Censorship has a way of acting, as Ira says, like poison gas. It might seem like an effective tool when the enemy's in your sights, but the wind has a way of shifting. And I've been heartened, at least with the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, to see a lot of Jewish groups come out in opposition to it. I think there was an editorial and tablet where the headline was, Not in Our Name. So yeah. there is a broad coalition here. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our show, Just Asking Questions. You can watch another clip here or the full episode here. And please subscribe to Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed for notifications when we post new episodes every Thursday.